Live to see it, friends. I'm Phil Bowermaster, and you're listening to Fast Forward Radio on the Blog Talk Radio Network. Fast Forward Radio is an audio production of the Speculist weblog, and you can find us online at www.speculist.com. This is the official podcast of The Speculist, and this is a show where we take a positive look at the future. And with me this evening, as is often the case, is my co-host and co-blogger, Stephen Gordon. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Phil. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing? Man, I'm, I'm doing great. I uh, hope you're ready for Christmas. It's, uh, it's upon us, man. You know, if you're not ready now... You got to what about uh, about twenty four hours to get ready? So well, thank goodness for the you know like uh, Walmart you know, it's staying open twenty four seven these days. Um, it's it saved my it saved my life last year. I, well, I'm kind of proud of myself this year. I got uh, most of it done. I, I would say you know I'm ninety nine percent done, and if the other one percent doesn't get done, then it's okay. I had it actually a, 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 the day before Christmas Eve. Had it all down to just the wrapping. So this is like the best I think I've ever done. Um, you know, that uh, there wasn't any actual additional purchases to be made a full 48 hours before uh, Christmas. So uh, the, that, that's it, great. That's a great. huge step forward for me, actually. And then I got my daughter to do the wrapping. So I'm just skating hey, and blowing smoke, man. That's, that's great, man. Um, Talk about well, automation, outsourcing, you know, the four-hour work week, the whole thing. I'm making it happen right here. Well, I outsourced uh, a, uh, a lot here because uh, what I did is I got on Amazon.com and, and had them deliver it to me, so I didn't even have to go fight the crowd, which was awesome. I think I'll do that from now on. That is the way to go. I mean, Glenn Reynolds has been writing about that uh, frequently on uh, Instapundit, and if at the holidays it becomes more apparent, but that is just a great way to get stuff, especially if you're a, what do they call it, a premier member? I well, think. Amazon Prime, and Prime. Uh, he talked and he talked me into it. I mean, I, I I've been reading his posts about it for like a year, and he, and finally I, I see the point. You know, you you pay like uh, I think it's seventy something dollars, maybe seventy five dollars, something like that, and then you get free two day shipping for a year, and yeah, exactly. uh, you can you can pay for that real quick, and, um, and so I, I did it, and uh, I've, I've already paid for it with just you know the Christmas stuff. And uh, so, it, yeah, it's worth to me seventy five dollars just to not have to go Christmas shopping and and battle the crowds uh, at, at the Walmart and the Toys R Us and all that. All those other places, yeah. yeah. Well, I, in fact, the only time I went out and shopped at a store, I ended up having to return it, and it was like I had to stand in a big long line to buy it, and then it was it turned out it wasn't the right thing. I had to stand in a big long line to return it. Right. And I kept thinking, this is so much harder. Than just sitting at my computer and you know picking the thing and it's already got my credit card in there and it comes in two days and yeah yeah I'm I'm completely sold on that yeah well and, you know the only bad thing of course is uh, the worry that it won't get here advertising by the way I think we're really putting it yeah. out there for them I'm yeah. sorry you were saying well I mean the, I was about to say the only downside is the worry that it won't get here for some reason and so you know um, you can I, I think the thing I'm going to do next year is just order it all on December one you know. And that way, I've got. If there's a whole month basically to that uh, that the stuff can get in, and uh, then I don't have to worry too bad about it. And if for some reason something's on back order or something, I can make the decision. I still have time to go to the stores if I have to. But anyway, um, I was really thinking ahead. Yeah, we'll see. I, I'm gonna. We're gonna check in on that next. In week. one year, yeah, check and see if I'm uh, if I'm uh, stick with that goal. We'll see how you did on that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to uh, shift gears very quickly because there is uh, one segment that I want to make sure we get in this evening, and that is uh, an, an update of one of our, now I, I think we can call it a regular segment because this will be the, the third time we've done it, and this is a, a special holiday edition of a little something we like to call Hey, can I just say that was excellent timing. I think we're getting pretty good at this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't have to send you a chat message or anything. <laughs> yeah, just, I'll just play it. Yeah. So I've got two stories uh, for us tonight on Tales of the Paranormal, and one of them is an uh, upbeat, life-affirming, happy Christmas thing, a holiday thing, I should say, because, you know, obviously there's other holidays going on besides Christmas, and uh, the other one is uh, kind of a uh, sound, uh, sad, downer, kind of a uh, depressing uh, thing, so I'll start with that, okay? Okay, yeah, start with a, start with a downer, and then... Right. Yeah. Well, here it is. Now, I have chronicled, um, I think, to... To, to a great level of detail, the astounding coincidences between my life and the planet Mars. And this is well documented, and, and <laughs> we, we, I don't know why in the world you're laughing, but um, uh, this is well documented in a previous uh, edition of uh, Tales of the Paranormal. And I have to tell you something 
that happened last night. Okay, I'm coming into uh, my my house through my garage door, uh, the, the 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 house door that separates the garage from the house, and I think I just slightly brushed the uh, Black and Decker uh, charge unit that that goes on my lawn trimmer. Okay, I think I slightly brushed it. Well, anyway, later my wife comes through the door and the thing just falls, her smash, and it's and it just breaks. You know, it's this big heavy battery pack. Yeah, yeah. It, doesn't, it does not work anymore. Okay, I'm telling you, the thing is ruined, and I'm, I'm going to have to buy a new Black and Decker battery pack. Or if anyone listening, you know, hey, the holidays are here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's perfect gift for uh, the speculist here this year. But anyway, so this thing is wrecked, and and so okay, well, it's a bad household accident. Doesn't mean anything necessarily, does it? But then I go online this morning and I see the headline, and I think we've all seen the headline: asteroid may hit Mars in next month. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and if there are any Black & Decker items that happen to be on the surface of Mars, you know, uh, then, then they're liable to get smashed. Well, they, they might, in fact, but I, I guess the point is, I think it, this is symbolic. The Black & Decker thing is, you know, <laughs> this is a premonition of, I think, that the asteroid is almost certain to hit Mars. And, you know, people who, who uh, want to just write that off as some kind of coincidence, I think, are in denial. I actually mentioned the connection to Mars to my wife, and she said that it doesn't even rise to the level of being a coincidence. She said there is no conceivable connection between the two at all. So <laughs> yeah. She's clearly in very heavy denial. But yeah, apparently. Yeah, because, people, I, I, because I'm in awe of the, uh, of the level of <laughs> convergence some, there. Yeah, some people are ready. That's, yeah. the, that's the point, Stephen. You yeah. and I, we're ready. Okay, We're ready to talk about these things. We're ready to think about these things. You know, some people aren't ready, and that's okay because they're going to get ready. Okay, when, when the rock hits Mars and people go, wow, that, that Black & Decker battery pack did fall, now an asteroid has hit Mars. I think they'll be coming back with <laughs> yeah. a slightly different tone. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and so is that the downer? Uh, That's the downer. Oh, okay, it's, okay. It's, so it's, the downer is you, you've lost a Black & Decker item. Okay. Yeah, but now, okay, on the upside, here's a little holiday shopping tip for the uh, paranormal enthusiast on your, uh, on your gift list. I don't know if you saw this one, but uh, I, I linked to it myself because I was so taken with it. The Monster Spotter's Guide to North America. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Um, that. I, I, you know that that's pretty cool. That it, it, apparently it's uh, it tells you all the different things, uh, all the different places that like Bigfoot's been seen, right? Exactly. It tells you you know state by state where you can go and what monsters they have available in each state. Yeah. And and I read about this one. Okay, let me tell you about the lizard man. Okay, characteristics: tall, humanoid biped with thick green lizard-like skin, reptilian features, and red eyes. Size approximately seven feet tall. Appetite unknown. Um, uh, apparently, the, these have been seen across the country, although this one is particular to a certain area. But uh, they've been known to exhibit aggressive behavior and uh, seem to be fond of chasing after automobiles. Okay. Well, um, except for the uh, seven feet tall business, it sounds like me after a couple of all nighters. <laughs> <laughs> now, I wouldn't know. I would not know about that. I, you know, uh, uh, if you get if you get particularly scaly, if you like to drive, uh, chase cars. Um, you know, <laughs> aggression, there, 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 aggression, could, yeah. there could be something there. But I, I guess uh, it all started back in 1973. Reports of an alligator-like humanoid creature circulated in this area. Now, I'm, I, since you don't know, I'm going to ask you to guess where, in what state, is the lizard man? Um, I would, I would guess someplace like maybe Florida. Yeah, well, you would think an alligator-like creature. I thought you might even guess uh, your own home state of Louisiana. Yeah, or Louisiana. Yeah, that would be a good place for a lizard man or an alligator man to be from. He's actually from the Garden State, New Jersey. <laughs> okay. But I didn't want you to feel left out, so I went and looked to see if there was a good uh, Louisiana monster. And I happen to know there's one right down the road, uh, a big, uh, a well-known Bigfoot, uh, you know, sighting location. Oh, so you guys got the Bigfoot thing going. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. In we, Louisiana. Uh, the Boggy Creek Monster, they made a movie out of it uh, back in the 70s. Well, now, I thought that was in Florida. Nope, nope, nope. That's uh, that was in Louisiana. The legend is right up the road. Uh, the um, it's where the Boggy Creek Monster apparently is from. You know, I never saw that movie, but I always wondered uh, as a kid because that came out when I was a kid. So that's going back quite a few years. Yeah, I always wondered how scary could that movie possibly be if it was rated G. <laughs> you know, they made it look like it was this really scary thing, and I'm like, come on, you know, nobody's going to get like their head ripped off by Bigfoot or anything. Not a rated G movie like that. Yeah, back in those days. But I did come up with a good Louisiana monster I wanted to tell you about. Okay. Um. Louisiana has its own version of the werewolf, and okay. uh, he's a Cajun uh, version of the werewolf, and his name is Loop Garou. Have you heard of this guy? No, no. Well, I, d I actually don't have any details on him other than that he's a Louisiana werewolf, and he's named Loop Garou. He is featured in the book, but my speculation is that uh, before he uh, 
before he chows down on his victims, he probably puts a little cayenne pepper, maybe. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Them, to enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, but, and, and his victims don't yell, you know, any any way but I. E. They <laughs> <laughs> give a good I. E. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> oh yeah. So anyway, highly recommended Monster Spotter's Guide to North America. Good gift giving uh, <laughs> idea. Also, um, now that I'm thinking about it, uh, yeah, Black and Decker battery pack. Also an excellent idea for a gift. And uh, that will actually do it for this edition of. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil. I was not on the top. Not on top of it that time. Let me try that now. <laughs> okay. Well, that was you know we're one for two on that one. I I should never have commented. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I think I probably jinxed us right there. Right well, there. I, I failed to mention uh, earlier who we've got coming on the program here, uh, joining us in just a few minutes. But I should have mentioned that we've got uh, uh, Dr. James Hughes uh, uh, with the. Uh, Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies is going to be joining us and uh, talking with us about probably a wide variety of topics. And uh, in the second half of our show, starting at halfway, at, what is that, the bottom of the hour? Is that what you call that? Yeah. 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 The bottom of the hour, we'll be taking your calls at 347-215-8972. Well, and it looks like uh, Dr. Hughes just called in. So. Well, you know what? That perfect. We're, we're running a little bit ahead, so why don't we go ahead and bring him on. Let me introduce him, Dr. James Hughes is the Executive Director for the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies. He is a bioethicist and sociologist at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where he teaches health policy. He also has a doctorate in sociology from the University of Chicago, where he taught bioethics. Dr. Hughes is the author of Citizen Cyborg, Why Democratic Societies Must Respond to the Redesigned Human of the Future. And he produces a syndicated weekly radio program, the very excellent Change Surfer Radio. Uh, Dr. Hughes is also a fellow of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities and the Working Group on Ethics and Technology at Yale University. He speaks on medical ethics, health care policy, and future studies worldwide and appears often on radio and television. Dr. James Hughes, welcome to Fast Forward Radio. My pleasure to be here, guys. Well, it's great to have you. I know we've got uh, an awful lot we want to get into. I do want to start off just uh, saying something about uh, Change Surfer Radio. How long have you been doing that, actually? Oh, you, uh, you, you broke, broke up just a little there. Uh, I'm sorry, I, say I again. started that in 1998. 98, so that you're looking at your 10-year anniversary coming up for, the, for that. Absolutely. A lot of other misadventures on my part, all fruitful. Yeah, well, they always, they, they, I won't say always, they often uh, turn out to be the case. Now, uh, the reason I was going to ask is because, you know, we've been doing this uh, for, what what now, three years, Stephen, I guess, maybe? Well, actually, 2005 is when we uh, cranked off the first Fast Forward Radio. Okay, so we're, we're looking, at our, looking at our third year anniversary. And, of course, uh, Change Surfer Radio has been a big uh, inspiration for us along the way. And I was just wondering, uh, so going back ten years, uh, have you always had sexy in your tagline? Or is that a, a more recent? Edition? Yeah, some people actually ask me about that. I did more about sex back in the day, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, the original inspiration for that was the notion that um, lefties think absolutely get negative about things. Uh, and I, uh, Doctor Hughes, that. I'm sorry, you're you're breaking up pretty bad. Um, oh, I, am I? Yeah, you um, are. Do you, well, let me call you back on my uh, on my other phone here. Let me. Okay. okay. That'd be great. That'd be great. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, we we don't want to lose any uh, any of the details on why why the show is called sexy. Yeah, no doubt. No we doubt. want to hear all that. Well, he, he's going to call us right back, and that's fine. We've we've dealt with technical difficulties before on this show, haven't we, Phil? We have. Well, we were just talking about that before we uh, before we came on. That we're ready for just about anything to happen. So yeah, that's right. That's a great way, I guess, of making things happen. That's right. Well, ask for it like that. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Um, while we're waiting on him to call back, I was going to ask if you'd seen the National Treasure movie uh, yet. Phil. No, got the both the uh, wife and child eager eager to go see it. I kind of have to be dragged to that one. I'm I, I wasn't too wild on the first one, so I, I'm not uh, I'm not convinced that I really want to go see the second one. But uh, you're you're going to prove me wrong here and tell me how great it was. Well, I, I think that if you weren't uh, if you didn't like the first one, you probably won't like the second one because it's. But if you're a fan of the first one, you'll love it. It's it's more of the same. Anyway, l- let's bring our guest back on. Oh, okay. Jay, are you there? Uh, James, are you uh, Doctor Hughes? Are you there? 
Well, I've, I've got him there, but he's not. Apparently, can't hear us. Well, now this is like two weeks ago. Wow, we're, <laughs> yeah, we're not getting, only are we're, we're getting we're running the game. Yeah, problems. we're trying them all out tonight. Okay. Well, I, okay, we've lost him, and he, I'm sure he'll call back. So. He will call back. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. As far as the National Treasure movie, movie goes, uh, it's 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 uh, it, it's pretty much the same. If you enjoyed uh, the first one, you will like this one a lot as well. Um, I I, uh, I thought it was action packed and uh, and had some clever plot devices that you know they, they, I was not expecting they they threw at threw at us so it was it was fun. Let's see. Well, I will say I like I like Nicolas Cage quite a bit so yeah. we'll, we'll probably end up going. Doctor Hughes, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, we got a storm going on here. It's uh, it's getting pretty nasty outside. So looks wow, like breaking up on you. With, with electrical storm. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, like, just a rainstorm and oh, winter rain. Oh, okay. I was thinking lightning. I'm going, wow, that's that would be bad this time of year, huh? That would yeah. <laughs> well, you're loud and clear now. We can hear you great. Okay, good. Fantastic. Well, anyway, you had asked uh, what the inspiration for the sexy part was, and yeah. the answer to that is just that I uh, felt that the, one of the inspirations for the show originally was the notion that uh, progressives had gotten pretty negative about things, and um, I was attracted to a more positive vision of the future, a vision that was a little bit sexier, as it were. And But I also uh, was talking a lot more about uh, culture politics back then, and, and sex was a part of that. So there are various, various reasons. I, I've always been interested in the transgender movement as a way that um, there's a connection between the kinds of transhumanist topics that you guys and I am interested in and uh, what's happening on the ground in terms of culture politics. And so we talked a lot about transgender back in the day. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I yeah. can see. I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. There, there definitely is a, a connection. We've 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 written a little bit about that too. Kind of the, the the, the connection between uh, uh, the, the well, we we haven't talked much about the transgender movement, but the but the the notion of transgender and how that relates to the the notion of transhumanism. I mean, it's all part of the same, ultimately part and parcel of the same kind of evolutionary process going on. I would I would guess. Uh, we we would like to include sexy in our tagline, but I just don't know if Stephen and I can pull it off. <laughs> We've thought about it, you know, but uh, I, I don't know. It'll, it'll, it'll be a while, I think, before we're able to stick that in there. Well, speak for yourself, Phil. <laughs> Fair enough. That's, that's, that's a good point. Uh, so um, let's let's get into talking a little bit about transhumanism. And um, I had the pleasure of seeing you at the uh, Singularity Summit. Didn't didn't get a meet with you. Uh, again, I, I blame John Smart for that. I think it's hard to get a word in edgewise uh, when, when he's around. But... Um, let me let me set the stage here, and, and you can uh, you can you can correct my misperception if this is a misperception. Okay. Okay. M- my notion is that, uh, and, and I'm I'm talking strictly in uh, rhetorical terms here, but uh, my notion is that uh, sooner or later there is going to be like a major smackdown between like you and Eliezer Yudkowsky. Is that is that uh, is that fair or? <laughs> well, uh, Eliezer and I have had our disagreements over the years. Um, we're actually on fairly good terms nowadays. Uh, it's not so much a, a, a personal politics issue, although some people have seen it that way in the past. I, I've always felt it was more of a philosophical, historical, cultural disagreement about the nature of the coming changes. Um, I think uh, what singularitarianism means for a lot of people is that there's going to be some kind of uh, technological whiz-bang thing that's going to happen to us all and all of our problems will be wiped away and it becomes this kind of techno-rapture kind of idea and that means that uh, the folks aren't terribly concerned or uh, working very hard on the ways to make sure that it turns out good because they they have a strong confidence that it's going to turn out good. And um, they also don't tend to be very worried about things like global poverty and crime and war and terrorism and things like that, which are, which may you know make those those whiz bang possibilities wipe them off the table. So, I, I've always been arguing that we need to be a heck of a lot more realistic. It may be true that some of these technologies, like greater than human artificial intelligence, uh, could create radically new possibilities for humanity, but. Um, uh, you know, I, I just don't think that we should put faith in the kinds of solutions that these guys come up to to the kinds of problems that we all imagine might cre- get created. And one of those solutions is the friendly AI solution, which I don't hold much stock with. And, in fact, uh, 
keep, keeping in, in, in line with the, uh, with, with the SmackDown analogy, it seems like the, the, the real throwdown has occurred with the term code worshiper. Uh, could, you, could you tell us <laughs> what that's all about? Well, you know, whenever you talk to anybody involved in anything, like you know, if you argue with a Christian and you say, Christians believe X and Christians have a characteristic tendency to do Y, well, they'll say, well, what about Kierkegaard or, you know, what about St. Augustine? He wasn't like that. And uh, it's certainly true that, you know, in every movement and every philosophical uh, t- tradition, there are people who are not representative of the central tendency. But I would say that, for me, it's one of the central tendencies, one of the central things about the couple dozen people that I know who write about and talk about being singularitarians and try to represent themselves as singularitarians is that they distrust uh, human nature and the Darwinian imperatives of human nature um, vis-a-vis what might be created, the kind of pure, friendly AI idea that might be created out of code. And you know that idea is literally a deus ex machina idea, that is a god out of a box idea that somehow all of the human problems that are created by our monkey brains are going to be uh, made irrelevant when we can create a god out of uh, out of code uh, that's going to be super powerful and super friendly. And I think that that's, you know, that, that doesn't convince me. It doesn't convince me that they'll pay attention to us in the first place, even if they were possible. Right. And it, does, and it doesn't convince me that you can make something which uh, cares about humanity in that kind of a way outside of a theological thought experiment. Okay. Well, what, what, what do you think about um, ideas like uh, the, uh, well, no, no, I'm not going to be able to think of the term. It's the uh, coherent extrapolated volition. I did think of it. The the the, the notion of building uh, maybe the pinnacle of what the good side of our whole our Darwinian evolutionary process would have been into into them, making them as good as we ever were, and then and then better. That doesn't uh, that, that doesn't wash right. with you. I, I think the only people who could propose such an idea are people who are pretty much not aware of the last 400 years of political philosophy because, you know, if you go back to people like Rousseau, uh, the notion that there was a popular will which could be somehow discerned eventually led to the creation of totalitarianisms of both the right and the left, fascism and communism, which believed that through some kind of social process you could uh, discern what the popular will was and then enforce it back on everybody. I I think that what we've discovered uh, through the last couple hundred years of trying to figure out what good social organizations are is that we don't want to give that kind of power to any, uh, you know, thing that thinks it has the popular will in in mind and uh, then enforces it back on us. And so basically, these guys have recreated the notion of benevolent dictatorship. And uh, you know, there's a, a very, very, very small possibility that they might actually have a benevolent dictator this time, and it might, in, in fact, do what benevolent dictators are always supposed to done do. But I just don't buy it. I, I think that we need to imagine futures in which uh, conversation between equals is still the way that we get things done. Absolutely, absolutely, it, it, and, and primarily because it, it seems to work. It's uh, exactly. it, it, it's not it's not that it's uh, necessarily uh, the most appealing uh, on paper, but uh, it, it, you know it's it seems uh, the you seem to get something that actually works and, and allows people to uh, uh, pursue their own goals better. It's when, messy. Yeah. It's messy, and engineers don't like messy. They, yeah, they yeah. like they like purity, and that's you know, right. Yeah, it's it's messy, and and it would be hard. It's hard to quantify, but you know, well, freedom is always I mean, messy. Yeah, what they're trying to do is is to quantify that somehow. That's yeah, the, exactly. That seems to be the effort. So so let's talk about a conversation between equals. Can 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 a conversation between equals exist between occur? I should say between human beings and machines. Well, I think uh, that's another one of the questions that we disagree on about what the priority should be between human enhancement and the enhancement of, uh, of human capabilities uh, and the enhancement of machines. I'm, they are very unhappy with the notion that artificial intelligence seems to have created lots of specialized extensions of human powers, um, you know, Google being an example of that which make us individually or, and collectively smarter, but don't create uh, a brain in a box. I'm perfectly content with that because I don't want to actually have my toaster argue with me about whether, whether to give me toast, and I don't want my nuclear weapons 
systems to uh, decide that you know other things need to be nuked than what I think should be nuked. I think that what we want is for human beings to collectively to get as smart as we possibly can, and then we might have a shot at staying one step ahead of smart machines. But, and, and for that to happen, for human beings collectively to get as smart as possible, can human beings individually get smarter? I mean, do you, is that part of the process, or how do you see that fitting in? Yeah, the two go absolutely together, of course. You, you want everybody to, have, to reach their full capacities of intellectual ability, and then for all of us to be plugged together in as smart a way as we possibly can through smart societies and uh, be totally wired and have good educations and have smart economies and, and all kinds of ways that human beings get plugged in together. I think that that's a third area in which I and the singularitarian engineers uh, tend to disagree is that I have always believed that the worrying whiz of communication between human beings and machines and among machines is a, an ecological framework in which um, artificial minds, or, or perhaps at first just artificial life of various kinds, is going to emerge. And I don't think that you have to focus, or you know, I don't think that it's necessarily the only place to look is, is in the boxes where guys are actually trying to build artificial minds. I mean, we didn't evolve because, I don't believe, because anybody created us. Uh, we evolved out of random, you know, collections of, of molecular processes. And I think that the internet and the, the collection of everything that human beings are doing on the planet could create artificial life and artificial minds at a meta level that we just currently can't imagine. Uh, do you think it's happened or is happening now? I think that in some ways uh, human organization has always been a kind of meta level group mind and that you see increasingly sophisticated uh, ways in which that's true, organizations like the Catholic Church or uh, major corporations, they have uh, institutional memory, they have ways of uh, replacing cells. You know, if a, if a certain person in a certain position in an organization dies, then the organization that's another person and trains them to do what that previous person did, and there's an organizational memory that sends chemical signals to that person to tell them what they need to do. There are many ways in which social scientists have pointed out the organismic parallels of human organization to, um, to or, you know, human organisms or biological organisms. And, and so, you know, to just completely ignore the fact that human beings are already creating <clears throat> meta-human intelligence and that that meta-human intelligence might, in fact, have something to say about whether there's going to be these uh, super-intelligent AIs to <laughs> compete with on the, fr on the scene, you know, the governments, in other words, might have something to say about whether they want those super intelligent AIs to just wipe government off the map. Um, I think that that's you know a naive view. Well, and 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 this is how you're not a techno or technological libertarian. You're um, is the way I understand uh, based on your book, uh, Doctor Hughes. That's, that I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I'm not a libertarian. I'm I'm a traditional social democrat or progressive in some ways. At any rate, I. I believe that government is inevitable and it's best when it's democratic. Um, and I also believe in, you know, relatively free markets and relatively free labor markets and all those kinds of things. So I'm not, a, I'm not off the charts on the left end either. But, um, yeah, this is one of the areas where Silicon Valley engineer types and I also tend to disagree is on the relative utility of things like the Food and Drug Administration or the Environmental Protection Agency. Right. Well, I mean, uh, we... You know, there, we regulate uh, what people put in their bodies now. A lot of there are people uh, that would say that you know it's my body; I can do whatever I want to with it. Uh, but you know, uh, as a group, we have decided that no, you can't put crack in your body. You can't. Uh, you know, there there are certain things that you can't ingest uh, because uh, we as a group are diminished if enough of, if enough of us are doing these things. Well, like you in New York, you can't put trans fat in your body, right? Actually, I guess you can. You just you can't get it at a restaurant. <laughs> That's right. So there, are certain, there are certainly examples that I will disagree with. But, you know, you see the hullabaloo that gets created when we start importing Chinese toys that have lead in them. Right. And then somebody says, why didn't somebody do something about that? And then the Chinese says, okay, we'll do something about it. They go out and they execute the head of their Food and Drug Administration. Right, right. 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 Uh, well, we have a better way of dealing with it, and that's just to have a fully accountable and independent and well-funded uh, agency that takes care of those things. We, we often uh, stray away from uh, politics, but I, I think it's fair to get a little bit into uh, political philosophy because it's, it, it's come up now. Do, do you see any kind of convergence 
occurring between what were once kind of polarized positions uh, 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 on the on the on the political spectrum, enabled by technology. And that's kind of a loaded question, but let me give you the example that uh, that comes to mind. I think of the uh, the, the book that uh, that Glenn Reynolds wrote, An Army of Davids, which you know Glenn is is nobody's uh, leftist. Certainly, you know he's certainly a, uh, a libertarian type um, accused of being a conservative, which which he rejects that rejects that idea. But the, the 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 message that comes through in that book, loud and clear, is the notion of kind of the uh, the, the the empowerment of the little man, right, or the little person through the uh, uh, through moving the means of production into the hands of the worker, right? Which is a you know when you state it that way, a, a trope from not just social you know democracy, but but flat out you know the Communist Manifesto. I would think um, are, is is that sort of thing just a coincidence, or is there an opportunity for? convergence or for something new kind of to emerge because of uh, what's happening with technology? Well, in uh, Citizen Cyborg, I do argue that the some of the questions that are being raised by biotechnology and the positions that people are adopting around them are a new political dimension that are different from uh, previous political dimensions. I wouldn't say that the one that Glenn uh, Reynolds has put his finger on is one that I would agree with. I think his argument that uh, technology is creating some kind of uh, radical decentering of power, that individuals are all going to be empowered by that. We've seen people argue that for literally decades, centuries even. Um, uh, people who, you know, in the 19th century we would have called utopian socialists who argued that industrial uh, civilization was eventually going to liberate everybody from work and there wouldn't be any need for governments anymore. And, and even Marx, you know, in a certain kind of light, it re reflects that kind of utopianism. That there's going to be a withering of the state. Right. I think it's just, I think it's pretty much hoo-ha. I don't, I don't think that, uh, I, I think that if, if you think that because you have a laptop or because you have a powerful uh, MP3 player that you have somehow become equally empowered with the National Security Agency, and you're going to be able to do whatever you like, and uh, you know, governments and banks don't have any control over your life anymore. Well, I don't know how to argue against that. You know, they still do. They can still come to your house and shoot you. Um, if you want to have power, you organize a political party. You uh, you you publish a newspaper. You know, you uh, organize a nonprofit organization. You do all the things that people have traditionally done, which involve or collectively organizing with other people. Now, I know that Glenn thinks that that's a part of this process as well, but we, we've known that the power of civil society, the organizations in civil society, is the principal balance against state power and against uh, unaccountable corporate power. So, but that's not new. That's not being empowered by technology. And it may be, in fact, being disempowered by technology because you know, one of the one of the principal organizations of civil society that was the basis for the democratization over the last hundred years was the trade union, and trade unions have been declining because of the decline of a, a form of industrial labor that enabled them to have a tremendous sway. And now we don't have anything to replace the kind of power that trade unions once had. You know, blogs don't have the kind of power that trade unions one had, once had. Political parties have collapsed uh, in equal measure. So. I think we still need to figure out what the democrat what kind of democratic civil society can be enabled by net culture that will be equivalent to the old ones that we had. Okay. But and they're not equivalent yet. They're not yet. No. Okay. Uh, do you see any glimmer that they that they might be heading in that direction or I think there's a lot of promise in things like um social networking uh sites um you know I I have the the whole uh, net roots phenomenon that grew up around Howard Dean's uh, candidacy a couple of years ago, and uh, sites like Facebook and, and MySpace and all the things that happen around those. I, I think that those create the possibility, and perhaps virtuality as well. You know, Second Life and, and its descendants will be sites that create new kinds of community that will be equivalent to the old. Um, but it's not there yet. I mean, if you like um, meet uh, the, the meetup. A phenomenon is an example of that. I mean, there was a whole bunch of Howard Dean meetups four years ago. Then, where the transhumanists got involved, and um, so I only know about it from that angle. But we set up a whole bunch of transhumanist meetups, 
and they petered out because it turns out lots of people like to talk uh, from their homes or from their workplaces about transhumanism on, on lists. And people will even sign up and say, yeah, I'm going to go to such and such a place at such and such a time, and then they never get there. <laughs> and because they've never actually formed a face-to-face -face relationship with anybody else that's going to be mad at them for not having shown up at that meeting, no one ever shows up at any meetings. And, and I don't think we've figured out how to get beyond that. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's uh, kind of, you know, that's disappointing that, uh, uh, that, that something uh, – hasn't, I guess, emerged that can take hold of the, uh, I guess, enabling the leverage that the technology should provide. Because to me, I, I, I at least, I, I see that part. You know, to go back to your original question, you know, do, do I think I'm equivalent to the NSA because I got a laptop or an MP3 player? No, I don't. But uh, we put out a blog that uh, we're, we're looking for having, uh, you know, 100,000 unique visitors this month, which is a, a huge milestone for us. And we put out a podcast that... Uh, literally now thousands of people listen to. And to me, there is a, a little bit of a leveling of the playing field. I don't know how I would have, um, prior to this technology being in my hands, I don't know how I would have ever had that kind of an audience. Now, again, we're not political, so we're not putting out a, a particularly political message. But, but the notion that, um, that we've been empowered by the technology, that the technology has enabled us and freed us in some ways, still seems uh, at, at least... Uh, a tempting idea to try to entertain. I, I definitely think that it's possible, but again, the, the problem that I have with Glenn Reynolds and, and that perspective is that it's, it doesn't focus on the ways that people actually do have countervailing power against governments. You know, this notion that an army of individuals will somehow be able to stop the abuses of the Patriot Act or stop the Iraq War, what, you know, whatever example you want to give. I just don't see how it's actually shown to be the case in the real world. But I do think that um, there are going to be new forms of social organization that are going to get enabled. And, and you're right, my radio show and yours both are examples of ways that the technology has uh, enabled um, political participation that it hasn't, we haven't had before. But you know, I used to do zines back in the 1980s. I, did, I started a zine called Eco-Socialist Review. And the um, and zines seemed like a great idea at the time because you could uh, publish and create a, a professional-looking publication in ways that um, in ways that only had been accessible to people with major publishing tools before that. But what impact did zines have? I mean, you know, there's maybe a couple major magazines or publications or political events that were impacted by zines, but I, I just don't see yet the same impact that something like the trade union movement. <laughs> Um, has had in the past coming out of our culture yet? Not not that level of like transforming society certainly that uh, that you saw from that, or or I guess really amassing and organizing political power. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just uh, a reminder for our listeners: you're listening to Fast Forward Radio on the Blog Talk Radio Network. We're talking with Dr. James Hughes from the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies. We will now open up the lines for your calls: three four seven. 2158972 if anyone listening in would like to talk with Dr. Hughes we will uh, we'll be looking for those calls I wanted to ask you Dr. Hughes um, it's been now a few years since you've written Citizen Cyborg um, are we closer to the future that you were looking at uh, in in that book yeah I think so by the way I'm working on a second book called uh, Cyborg Buddha which is about neurotechnology so I've been thinking a lot about that topic recently well that's but, a um, great great title I <laughs> that is <laughs> that title I, is great it it's been a really interesting project i you know I'm a former Buddhist monk and uh have always had an interest in religion. I did my bachelor's thesis on Pentecostalism and um have have been involved in religion all my life and uh so the questions around human character, virtue, moral behavior, all of these are, are very topical in the bioethics field right now because of neurotechnologies. And uh, so it's, it's really coming together as a great project. But at any rate, the uh, Cyborg Buddha, there were, or the Citizen Cyborg rather, there were two major aspects of Citizen Cyborg that I was kind of prognosticating about. One was the technologies, the basic transhumanist timeline of when we can expect various things to come on the scene and how they, how we should be preparing for those uh, technologies. And the second is what impact those were going to have on our politics and our culture. And I think I'm still pretty much on track. It's only been a couple of years, but I, it seems like 
uh, many of the things that I was talking about then are coming to pass that, for instance, um, bioconservatives, one of the predictions of the book was that biopolitics was going to become an increasingly important way that people understood and organized themselves politically. And I think bioconservatives, people who oppose uh, our, our rights to use these various technologies in self-determining ways are coming together from the right and the left and saying, you know, we disagree about abortion or we disagree about the economy or whatever, but we all agree that we hate the transhumanists. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so you see people who were, you know, at each other's throats for decades coming together and forming new organizations and having conferences together on the agreement that they hate us. And, um, who? Uh, yeah. Hey, at last, there's that political mobilization you were looking for. <laughs> Glad you could provide it, right, Dr. <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, the, on the converse, I, we don't, haven't had as much uh, unity on the transhumanist side, and that's partly because we're such a net-based. I mean, this may be my bitterness about the lack of political organization coming out of um, the net is, uh, is partly about how weak we are organizationally, whereas... The folks on the, you know, the bioconservative side, they have very strong churches, for instance, as a base for their political organization. They have think tanks. They have, you know, various kinds of organizations. We basically have a lot of email lists and blogs and, you know, people who are very, very loosely connected through net culture. That has a certain strength that makes us kind of flexible. We can, um, you know, with very, very few resources, we can get our message out to the world compared to millions that they pour down toilets on the other side. But on the other hand, it would be great if we had our own think tanks and our own political organizations that were trying to do the same thing. We don't quite yet. Do you foresee that coming, though? I do, and, and there are places where it's beginning to happen. Italy is one place. The Italian Transhumanist Association is uh, is very powerful. It has about uh, 250 members, but it's been attacked numerous times by the uh, Catholic Church in various venues, and um, it has a block that it's organized in one of the major political parties in Italy uh, that is actually in the governing coalition right now. So um, in Italy, you see an example of where transhumanism is talked about in the public press uh, as uh, an actual political player of some kind. Um, uh, the Finnish Transhumanist Association, Association is our best organized and has the highest per capita membership of any of our transhumanist groups in the world. Um, they haven't quite played a political role yet, but they're more uh, kind of entrenched in, in intellectual life in Finland than a lot of groups have been. When you talk about a high per capita rate, what are you, what are you looking at there in Finland? How, how many? Well, the, what, there's only uh, 5 million Finns or something, and they have something like 300 members. No, they have more than 200 members in Finland. So, oh, okay. So. Um, it's, it, you know, it's not many, but it's, uh, it's more than what most it, of them Yeah, it's a bigger subset of their, their population than, than others. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and since, you know, we're really talking about a kind of intellectual strata in various countries, it's a disproportionate weight in the population. But... At any rate, I'm beginning to see these these trends happen in various places in various ways, but it's, it all happens in, in uh, very culturally specific ways. So, for instance, we've got a huge growth of transhumanism right now in China, and uh, it, happen, it seems to be happening because of uh, discussion of transhumanism on Chinese blogs, and uh, so they're discovering the term and then linking back to our sites, but they have... Weak English skills, and so, you know, there's a lot of people are signing up on our site, and some of them are even signing up using Chinese characters, which our computer completely mangles. <laughs> we have no idea what they're actually you know, writing to us, but, uh, but it's growing. And so, but what do they understand by it? We haven't got a clue. You know, when the folks who have joined from Kenya and Uganda and Nigeria over the last couple of years, they basically see transhumanism as a kind of enlightenment on steroids, and uh, it's some, they, they very much want it. But it's not about debates about friendly AI or the, whether the singularity is a good idea or not or things like that. It's like it's progress. <laughs> we, want, we want Africa to get out of the mess that it's in. Transhumanists are about progress. We're transhumanists. <laughs> okay. so. I guess it, 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 it's sort of a thing that can be tailored to whatever the situation you find yourself in. in exactly. Some way. Yeah. Well, I, I think that... Um, you know, those who are united against you, I, I think they may not understand that you're not quite as radical as, you know, as, as, as some within the movement. Um, you know, you're, you, you, again, you're not, uh, you're not demanding the right uh, this minute to do anything you want to without, you know, to your body without regard to 
you know, uh, there being some input in the process, you know. Um, well, that's that's true. I mean, uh, my positions are different from the many of the uh, caricatured positions that uh, these folks attack. And for instance, my position on religion, which I've uh, bent over backwards. You know, sometimes when I wake up in the morning, I have my my hardcore Dawkins, you know, Sam Harris <laughs> gut feelings on, and I'm not very forgiving, but. Um, I do have this long-standing interest and engagement with religion, and I've written some uh, quite conciliatory things about the co- the compatibility, the potential compatibility between transhumanism and religion. And uh, I've spoken in religious venues and uh, tried to do some outreach in that way. But you know, they like to ignore that. They like to pretend like we're all uh, fire-breathing atheists uh, who want to destroy Christendom, and uh, and we're not all like that. Well, that's one of the one of the topics we we covered in when we were doing our online surveys a, a couple of years ago. One of them was, was a poll we did on God and the Singularity. And uh, really interesting points of view that, that were espoused, as you would, as you would imagine, amongst, uh, amongst speculist readers. But uh, uh, some, some interesting um, points of, if not absolute agreement, just sort of, you know, we're kind of closer than we thought on some of this stuff than, uh, uh, than, than we expected. And, of course, there, there was definitely some... Uh, some, some fire breathing on on one end and fire and brimstone breathing on the other end, but uh, but but kind of kind of this very interesting middle where where you could have a where you could have a conversation. Yeah, I I think that we I, I would like to as a political project do a little bit more outreach to the other side because I think there are some issues in which in which we can at least confuse the hell out of them. <laughs> uh, one is around gene patenting. I mean, a lot of them assume that we're just all gung ho for the notion that the human genome is going to be parceled out and sold to big corporations. And I have always opposed that notion. And I think if more transhumanists, you know, at least those of us who disagree with gene patenting, were to say, hey, let's sit down and have a serious conversation about what the consequences is going to be for general human access to beneficial gene therapies if the genome gets all parceled out this way, then maybe we should join hands and say, you know, from opposite ends of the biopolitical spectrum, we want to condemn this particular practice. I think that would be really interesting things to do. Absolutely, yes. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned think tanks. Um, where, where do you see uh, IWET fitting in with uh, kind of uh, w- what role does it have to play? Well, we're you know pretty much virtual at this point. I think it's been a very successful project up to this point, but we need to get, like all transhumanist institutions, WTA is in the midst of uh, its first major fund drive to, to raise 50 grand. So uh, those of you who are interested in doing that can go to the uh, transhumanism.org slash match site and read about the fund drive. Um, IET has just had a couple of very small grants and uh, has been combined about five grand a year as a budget, which compared to the really big think tanks, think tanks out there is nothing. Um, but, you know, when you look at the kind of web uh, hittage that the IET gets compared to places like the Heritage Foundation, right. they're doing pretty well. Um, so that's, again, this point that because we are smart, interesting, sexy, um, we can do a lot with a little, but it'd be great if we could do a lot with a little bit more. Absolutely. Well, we'll be uh, we'll, we'll be providing links, of course, from uh, speculus.com to IWT. Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, Stephen. Did you say something? No, no, I, I had not. Oh, okay. I was going to say. I, I appreciate your support. You bet. Yeah. Um, we would also like to talk a little bit about, I guess we sort of talked around it, but uh, the World Transhumanist Association. Now, what's your association with that? How are you connected with that group? Well, I was uh, pretty much the person who organized the kind of formal organization of it uh, about 19, uh, in 2002. And um, it was the first uh, uh, executive director. We appointed me ex- as executive director in 2004. I served for two years. Then uh, Julia Prisco took over. Now we have a new executive director named James Clement, uh, who comes out of um, uh, the life extension movement and was a former executive director of a couple other life extension organizations. So he's been bringing a new level of professionalism. I mean, I'm an academic, so I was able to bring a certain kind of organizational uh, expertise to to the task, but I didn't know anything about fundraising. And... um, James has organized this fund drive, and and I think we're all very optimistic about what he's going to be able to do. I'm the secretary of the the International Association. I'm on the board of directors. 
So you, you still are associated with them and work with them? And, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. And what's the relationship between those two groups, between the IWET and the WTA? Well, it's um, tangled. Uh, <laughs> it's, we, we, uh, the, Should we not go there? We don't have to go there. If it's not oh, no, 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 no. Oh, it's, oh. It's, I can I can phrase it this way. I mean, at various times, the IET has been more or less the think tank and um, kind of intellectual fighting arm of the WTA. The WTA is crippled in certain ways, in the, in that it's so politically diverse. We have people all the way from the right and the libertarians to the far left in the WTA. So if you sit down and you say, well, what do we think about cloning or something, then you have a very complicated discussion because you know we're all for eventually it being legal, but beyond that we can hardly say anything. And uh, we, you know, should, it be, should it be regulated by the FDA? Well, we want to eliminate the FDA or we want to strengthen the FDA and we can't figure out what we, what we believe. And plus, it's an international organization, so we have to accommodate you know, positions all the way from Africa to, to Europe. Um, and that makes it very complicated. And so the WTA is very broad but very thin in that way. Right. The IET is a group of, of thinkers, intellectuals, some of whom don't consider themselves transhumanists, and that's another important constituency for us to reach out to, people who say, like you know, John Harris is a British bioethicist who just wrote a book called Enhancing Evolution. He's absolutely uh, on our side on every single issue. He doesn't want to call himself a transhumanist. Ron Green at Dartmouth just wrote a book about uh, engineering designer babies. He's absolutely on our side on every single designer baby issue. He doesn't want to call himself a transhumanist. So what do we do with those folks? We just say, you're not a transhumanist, then you can't come to our conferences and talk to us anymore. Well, the IET is a space where people who are transhumanists and generally agree about political issues and friends of ours in the academic and intellectual world can come together and start making a kind of concerted argument together. And we've begun to call that argument techno-progressive. Because we're not all of us are transhumanists, we have invented this new term, which is a term that generally means people who are pretty transhumanist on all topics but are also left, left of center. Okay. Very interesting. And probably even that uh, doesn't it doesn't bring in everybody though. No, it doesn't. It, it'd be hard to it'd be hard to come up with a term that would bring in everybody. No, well, we, we we're a very diverse group. Yeah. What I, what I like about what I like about IWT is when you talk in terms of uh, uh, ethics and emerging technology. You know, the, the idea of emerging technologies is certainly a a um, point of large mutual interest and agreement. That's for sure. But uh, I don't. Uh, you know. The, not quite enough to, to make a movement out of it, I guess, if you if you just uh, take it to that level. Right. Well, it's like, you know, we have Jume Castillo, who focuses a lot on geoengineering and uh, ecological solutions. Uh, we have um, Russell Blackford, who's a more or less traditional bioethicist in, in Australia. And uh, we have Bryce Intentia, who works on neuroethics issues. And so we're all working on different kinds of issues, but we all generally have this... Um, this techno-progressive uh, point of view, which is that you know, we need governments to regulate and, and make sure that things are generally accessible to everyone, but we shouldn't have a Luddite position on any of these technologies because, for instance, in the environmental uh, area, if you adopt a Luddite position and say, well, human beings should just stop doing what they're doing to the environment, and that's going to uh, make things get better. Well, it's not. We're, we're going to have to figure out technologies that actually fix the planet and not technologies that just stop us from, from screwing it up because it's already screwed up. Right. So, so if you're just a Luddite and you say, well, we just have to stop screwing it up, that's not going to get us where we need to go. So that's where the geoengineering things. And if you begin to think about issues in the, from that perspective, you begin to see, well, I, I'm generally connected to your stuff over here in neuroethics and I'm connected to your stuff over here in genetic engineering. Absolutely. Well, listen, I know we've kept you a little past the time that, uh, that we agreed to, although we got a little bit of a late start, so we wanted to uh, make sure that uh, you had plenty of time, that we had plenty of time to talk with you. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show. We hope that uh, we'll be able to have you back another time. I was thinking maybe we'll get uh, Eliezer on at the, on the same show. We'll have kind of a cage match. What do you think? <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> that would be great. I did want to clarify that. Of course, that's all just in fun, all that talk, smackdown talk and cage match and uh, Eliezer and I are we're kissy kissy face all the time. I, I absolutely so. <laughs> but we admire you both. Okay. Well, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to talk with us this evening. And uh, Dr. James Hughes, continued success to you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Looking forward to the next book. Okay. Good. 
All right. Okay. Well, that could have gone on a couple more hours, don't you think, Steve? <laughs> well, it seemed like we had a lot to talk about, a lot of things. And so, uh, unfortunately, we do have some time constraints here. And so, um, but, yeah, it was a great conversation. We ought to see if we can get him back on the uh, show in, in, in a little while. You know, I mean, get him back on maybe in a month or so. That'd be, not, that'd be great. Absolutely. It seems like we, we really only started to scratch the surface. There's, uh, there's an awful lot of good stuff to talk about. But uh, speaking of good stuff to talk about, I think you had a couple other items that you wanted uh, for us to go through this evening. Well, yeah, I, I got excited this week because I was. To me, it's always been a game changer if we get some way of producing electricity that is, uh, you know, that is clean and uh, and and it's cost uh, equal to or less than uh, what the grid power costs, which. And grid power, of course, is from everything. You know, when you when you're an energy producer, uh, you you put your energy out on the grid, and you could be the dirtiest polluter in the world, or you could be uh, you know, operating a windmill farm or something. Whatever, uh, you put it out on the grid, and it's used. And so, when you plug your when you plug your uh, uh, your toaster into the outlet, you don't know what you're getting. You know, it, right? It, you, you you know, you might be getting clean elect, electricity, or or it might have been produced by uh, by dirty electricity. It could have come from anywhere, right? Yeah, it, 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 coal, it could be a windmill. It could be hydroelectric. You just don't know. That's right. You just yeah. have no clue as to what is producing your power. But what if um, a community could come together and say, "Okay, we we're interested in uh, in in being clean now," and you know, it could be something along the lines of, say, California. I could imagine California doing something like this. Well. Um, a couple of different options uh, that I read about just this week. Uh, solar panels now, there's this one company that is uh, claiming that they've just begun selling solar panels that can compete with grid price, uh, with the grid. This is something that's brand new. Um, so talk me through this. So you put a solar panel on your house. Right. And that's going to power your home. Right. And what you're going to pay for those panels. Yeah, if you, if you are to, uh, you know... Uh, uh, you know, pay for them over a five-year period, uh, then it, it turns out that you're paying about what you've paid for for the grid. For your electric uh, bill. Yeah, exactly. You're not paying any more. And uh, in, at some point, you know, you, you, you might actually get out a little ahead once you pay it off. But what they're saying is that it's competing, it's competitive now with the grid. And the way they did this is interesting. Silicon is apparently the problem with, with – uh, um, with solar panels, it's the expensive part, right. and um, they they just replaced a, uh, about eighty percent, I think, of the silicon that's needed. Uh, they replaced it with aluminum, and they still have to use silicon somewhat. But by slicing it, uh, the amount that's needed uh, down that low, they they're all of a sudden. You know we're com- we're competitive with the grid pricing, so that's huge to me. There's no, there's I can't imagine any electric power that's cleaner than solar. You know? Well, that is the cleanest. I, I would think, though, here's my immediate uh, response to that. It, it would seem like it would depend a lot on the climate where you live, right. because you're going to get enough sunlight, uh, the size of your house, and the level of electricity that you use. Every- I mean, it seems like all of those are going to have to come into play when you start, because it's going to vary so widely from place to place, uh, even how much sun you get, right? And Sure. And, and even if you do put these panels on you're still going to be connected to the grid right of course and uh it's one of the, uh, you know if you're connected well, you, i suppose you could have a house out in the middle of nowhere that that would not have had electric power otherwise you put enough pa- solar panels and, and you're off the grid so yeah, a lot of you know off the grid people do that but this is you know for for the rest of us we're going to be on the grid and we might have solar panels we might have a windmill on our roof or you know, a number of things um, that just slice our electric bill to nothing, and maybe we might even start getting checks because it can be sold back to the grid. I'd love that. Uh, wouldn't that, that be, be great? great to get a, get a check from the utility company every month, or just once, even would be. Uh, it would it'd be great? I, the other thing I read about this week, um, I, you know, I don't think I could handle it personally. I, I, I could, I, I could see uh, putting solar panels on my roof. You know, yeah. I could see doing that. Sure. Just you know, just going out and buying them and, and everything. That'd be great. But the other thing is mini nuclear power plants. Uh, right. I'm not, okay. not going to do that. I, I don't. I, me personally, I'm not going to bring in a uh, a box car sized uh, a nuclear plant and bury it in my backyard and uh, and sell all that power back to the grid. Uh, not that I wouldn't want to. I just uh, I don't have the millions of dollars that it would take. 
But, you know, if it's powering 400 houses, you know, um, I don't know, maybe a, maybe a municipality could do it. Uh, maybe a state could decide, okay, we're going we're gonna to buy 10 of these things and we're going to install them in various places. But the thing about it is it's absolutely no greenhouse gas involved, uh, no risk of uh, nuclear meltdown in these small uh in these small uh, power plants, and uh, so it's. What about it, containment and waste? Are there issues there? Well, it's uh, it's there's no water that goes in and out of these things. Okay. You, uh, you just they the the people that are selling them, Toshiba, I believe, and uh, Hiberion, is that the other one? I think so. Yeah, that's the one I believe we wrote about on uh, the better all the time before last. Right. They deliver it to your site. Mm-hmm. Okay. They bury it, and uh, and then. They come pick it up when when it starts. When it's out of juice. When it's out of juice and it needs to be recharged. So really, it's like this. Just I mean, are there moving parts? It's just this big nuclear battery, almost. Is that right? Or it's pretty much it, and it just does its job. And uh, there's not a lot of maintenance required, uh, is my understanding. And so you just they just deliver it to your site. It provides you a lot of electricity for a long time, and then they come pick it up and and recharge it and deliver it back or or, or send it somewhere else. But um, that's to me. That's that, and oh, and the thing about this, you know, the solar is just uh, right at grid grid power. I mean, grid uh, expense. Grid price. Mm-hmm. Grid price. Excuse me. Uh, this is like half the price of, of grid. You know. Okay, so you buy this thing, and it's going to provide power at about half the cost of what you would what you would pay. Get pay for off the grid. grid. So if you can if you can handle the initial outlay that it would take to have one delivered to your Region, site or yeah, or your or subdivision or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. Then uh, you, you're, you'll eventually be money way ahead. And so this is uh, to me, it was all very exciting. I, I think uh, what I'm seeing here is a possibility for a future where you know we're not only are we powering our homes and everything, but uh, you know uh, we'll be powering our cars in this way, and we can become a little bit more energy uh, independent. Not, I, I'm, not that I think that uh, energy independence is just, I mean, we, we have to be completely independent. I, I don't think that. But I, I think that um, if if we're not as dependent as we are right now, it puts us in a better position, you know, with with geopolitically. Absolutely. And, yeah. so, and, well, and, and Zubrin and, got into those topics a lot more when but, we talked to him. And, and getting back to our earlier discussion about individual empowerment, I mean, this is uh, – you know, not information technology. This is energy production technology being uh, pushed down to the community level, to a very small community level, or, or to, to your own house, right? right. Putting, put, putting the ability to collect that power right on your house. I kind of like the idea of working those two together. So you have the uh, you have the Porto Nuke uh, <laughs> powering yourself in your neighborhood, yeah. and uh, you got the solar panels up there. Then you could really make the nuke last a long time. And you, and you <laughs> yeah. virtually never have to touch the grid at that point, right? Uh, that would be awesome, wouldn't it? And I know what you want to do with this, then, Stephen, is you want to use this power to power your plug-in hybrid. <laughs> exactly, and and I want it to be a biodiesel plug-in hybrid to be to be precise. Exactly. Well, I, I, I just believe in the, the convergence of those technologies. I don't know. I I may turn out to be completely wrong, but that's where I see it going. Well, I set out my my uh, energy policy earlier in the week, where I said that uh, all new cars should either be flex fuels, taking the uh, uh, Robert Zubrin approach of methanol, ethanol, um, or gasoline hybrids. So, so uh, hybrids that, uh, that, that that will take any of those three fuels, or hybrids with electricity and uh, and uh, biodiesel. I, yeah. I, you know, if they, people would just listen to us, huh? <laughs> that's right. If we only ruled the world, everything would be just so much better. But then, I, you know, I, that's not what our guest would have thought. He, and we even benevolent dictatorships are not the best. We do, democracy has to stick with us, apparently. So. Right, but this is a way of uh, you know get him back on here. This is a way of democratizing power. Well, that's why we have to have him back on. We can, yeah, well, maybe well, maybe one of us should run for office at some point. Yeah. I, I, I think it'll have to be you. <laughs> <laughs> Too many skeletons in the closet. We won't go there. I'm sorry. I, well, we've already ruled me out as being sexy. So. <laughs> uh, since that's still open for you, I think you're the guy. Oh no, 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 no. Oh man. Um, I wanted to ask you music-wise tonight. Well, the thing I wanted to to get into the music. I wanted to ask you: Have you ever been guilty of regifting? Oh, yes. And I guess we should explain to our audience what that is. What what do you think regifting is? Regifting is very simply: uh, you get a gift, um, you don't use it, you don't, uh, um, you don't even take it out of the box necessarily. Necessarily, even take it out of the box. Generally, you have unwrapped it, thus you know what it is. Yeah, and you, uh, you said thank you to the person who gave it to of you. Of course, oh. you've thanked the person who gave it to you, and then you pass it on to someone else as a gift. 
Yeah. yeah. I, I'm pretty good at regifting because in my job, I occasionally get the odd gift from vendors. Yeah. And sometimes they're nice snacks and things that I want to eat, and sometimes I'm like, I really don't want to eat all this, and so I pass those on to someone else. Hope they're not listening now, because uh, <laughs> if you're listening, you're not the vendor that I did that with. I, <laughs> yeah. I really enjoyed your gift. Thank you very much for that. But well, the, the trick, of course, is, I mean, you got to make sure that the person who's receiving it is not aware that you're regifting. Right. Well, and, one, and, one and, warning is be absolutely sure it's not the person who gave you the thing in the first place. That's, that's right. That's well, rule one. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and even, even more important than, the, you know, that the person that you're giving the gift, you know, knows or, or doesn't know is that the person who gave you the gift doesn't know. You got exactly. to you, you keep everybody in the blind about, you know, that. And so, anyway, so our music actually gets into the, those issues, and and so it's pretty it's it's pretty appropriate for the holidays and everything, and pretty funny too. Uh, yeah. it, it's the Alice Project is the name of the band, and the song is regifting for the holidays. Regifting for the holidays. All right, right, so you found a you found a Christmas song for us, Dan. <laughs> That's right. Hey, uh, we're, are we going to uh, have a show next uh, next Sunday night? It's uh, it's going to be. I guess that would be our New Year's show, huh? That will be our New Year's show. We don't we do not have a guest lined up, but currently we are planning to have a show. So, well, we ought to what we ought to do is just we'll do all, all the co-hosts that have done the show with us. You know, uh, get on there and we just talk about. Um, you know, 2007 and and everything. That, I think that'd be an excellent show. That that will be a lot of fun. Let's extend that invitation to uh, uh, yeah everyone we've had on as a as a co-host. We'll see how many uh, see how many folks we can get on the line and just kind of have a free for all. That'd be great. Well, anyway, looking forward to that, Phil. And uh, I think you'll enjoy this music. Good night. Good night. Welcome to Staples. Staples Guide. This year I'm preparing my own taxes. Good for you. Yep, I'm going to be accountable. Right. Well, Staples can help with storage and filing supplies, plus software like QuickBooks and TurboTax. Go on. You have my interest. And now get TurboTax for up to 15